Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> my name is Jenny Gray, um, and I am here with BMSS. Um, I'm a senior manager, and BMSS is a CPA firm and an advisory firm. Um, BMSS was established in 1991 and has grown to be Alabama's largest locally owned accounting and advisory firm. With an innovative and service-oriented mindset, our ultimate mission is to provide peace of mind to our clients. Um, we now have six locations uh, throughout Alabama and now spanning into Mississippi. Um, our industries that we specialize in are uh, include manufacturing, distribution, construction, technology, nonprofits, government contracting, and governmental entities, as you know. Um, we're an independent member of the BDO Alliance, um, which is a nationally, a nationwide association of independent owned uh, local and regional accounting consulting and service firms with uh, similar client service goals. Um, if you want more information about the firm, you can visit www.bmss.com. Um, we have um, a company that is joining us today in our webinar, Abacus Technologies, which is based in Birmingham, Alabama, um, and specializes in offering customized cyber security, managed IT services, and business intelligence solutions that help companies unleash their full potential. Uh, with more than 20 years of industry experience, they have assisted numerous businesses in navigating the ever-changing technology landscape. By doing so, they've enabled companies to overcome today's challenges while also guiding them towards a more promising and accessible tomorrow. We would like to thank you for joining us today, how business intelligence benefits governmental entities. Um, a few little housekeeping things before we get started. Um, you'll notice at the bottom, uh, there is a Q&A button. If you have uh, any questions, you can uh, click on that button and submit those there. And we're gonna have a presentation for about an hour um, and 10 minutes. And we're trying to pack as much as we can into that period of time so that you can uh, benefit, you know, the most from your time here today. Uh, and then we'll have a series of uh, question and answers. So kind of our agenda for today, we're going to start off with um, two <clears throat> of our Abacus uh, technology uh, personnel. That's going to be David Brown and Jeremy Shank. And I will uh, give you just a little bit of information about them. Um, and I'm, I'm reading these bios and uh, if you've got any questions about them, either, you know, anybody just, you know, feel free to reach out and I can get you contact information from anybody that's um, on the webinar today. Uh, David Brown serves as the business solutions architect for the business intelligence team at Abacus Technology, the tech arm of BMSS. David is a CPA and was a controller for BMSS for many years. He started his career in accounting as an auditor and has also spent time in other business roles, including managing the IT environment for a CPA firm and managing shop operations for a fire truck refurb company. David loves understanding how things work, whether it's an internal combustion engine, manufacturing process, computer program, or multi-million dollar business. Learning how things work is a lifelong passion. Jeremy Shank is the data solutions architect for the business intelligence team at Abacus Technologies. As the only son in his family, Jeremy has always been the family's tech support and began his career that way as a support technician for BMSS. During that time, he began noticing trends in support requests, created reports to analyze those trends and created custom software scripts to automate the solutions to the most common requests. Shortly after that, he joined the Abacus team <clears throat> um, to bring solutions to their clients. Jeremy's true passion is finding the common threads and processes and automating them to save time and money, often joking that 70% of his job is figuring out how not to do his job through automation. Um, after we hear from David and Jeremy, we'll go into a period where we'll hear from Mindy Wyatt. Mindy is the strategic analyst for the city of Hoover, Alabama. She works with businesses, government leaders, and cities to plan and promote strategies to build a livable community and an accountable government that serves its citizens. Her focus areas include business analytics, performance metrics, strategic planning, and data and financial analytics. 
Um, it's now my pleasure to turn the webinar over to uh, David Brown and Jeremy Shank. And I think Jeremy's gonna take the microphone first. Um, really appreciate y'all joining us this morning. Um, we are gonna dive into our webinar and we want to reiterate that Abacus, we're all about client success through technology transformation. What we're really focusing on today is business intelligence. And throughout this whole webinar, we're gonna kind of talk about the what and why of business intelligence, the common problems that it solves, and again, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we want to start off with why do businesses need to be intelligent? And even take a step back from there, uh, we really want to address that we are focusing on government entities and particularly municipalities today. Uh, and so we are going to talk a lot about businesses, and sometimes that can feel a little disjointed, but we view a business as any entity that operates beha on behalf of its user base. So whether that's Abacus serving our technology clients, whether it's BMSS uh, serving businesses and individuals during this dreaded tax season, uh, don't forget to get your documents to your accountant, uh, or if it's a government at the local county or state uh, or even federal level serving its residents. And so with that, why do these entities need to be intelligent? Uh, there's three reasons that we're gonna look at primarily today. Uh, the first being decision latency and this rate of failure. There's a research uh, firm called the Standish Group that did a de decision latency study for software development companies. And they found that these software companies, if they took four hours to make a decision, which is really only half a day, they failed 66% of the time, those initiatives failed. And the companies that only had a one hour decision timeline, they failed half that time. So only 33% of the time did they actually fail. And now your timeline might not be just one hour versus four hours, but what if we multiplied that by an eight hour day? Uh, the difference between a decision at the end of the day and a decision at the end of the week can double your chance of failure. So really the longer it takes to come to a decision, the greater the risk of failure. We think that we are gonna take a long time, decide on this, and we're gonna look at every angle. But the reason that when we take a longer time to make a decision uh, is our second point, that businesses have inertia. And really that's just the longer that things go on, the harder it is to stop or change course. So if we think about a snowball that is going down a mountain, eventually turning into an avalanche, none of us wanna be wiped out by the avalanche. Instead, what we wanna do is put our businesses on the right track and have it run more like a freight train. So freight trains really hard to stop, but they carry vital supplies so that we can be successful. And finally, we need our businesses to be intelligent so that we can stay relevant amongst our competitors. Uh, they're not gonna wait for us. They're going to continue and improve. So we must also. Now I have really fond memories of uh, going to the pizza place when I was growing up and we would put our order in there and then we would walk right next door to Blockbuster and we would pick out our movies for the weekend. Uh, that was a great time, but none of us wanna be Blockbuster. There's none of them around anymore. So we've got to be in, our, our businesses have to be intelligent so that we can uh, decrease our rate of failure so that we can stay on the right track and that we can uh, continue to be relevant. If we'll go to the next slide. And throughout the webinar, you'll probably see poll questions pop up. Uh, please don't forget to fill those out. That's how we track attendance so that you can get CPE. Um, so what is business intelligence? If you look up the definition, you'll get some paragraph long 
Uh, business intelligence is how businesses utilize technology to gather and understand data to make more well-informed decision, data mine their customers, and all of these other things on and on and on. What How we define business intelligence is turning data into information and information into action. So those are the two things that we want you to remember today, that business intelligence takes data and it turns it into information and then we're going to take that information and act on it. And our team lives and dies by this definition. We've made it our mission to help businesses get better with the use of data. And the rest of our time, we're going to work out how we do that and uh, what better can look like for you. So you'll go to the next slide. We're going to focus on data into information. And there's two pieces of this. So the first one is gathering and watching your KPIs. A uh, KPI is a key performance indicator. It's the most important thing for your business. Oftentimes, if you're not sure what a, your KPI is, when someone asks you, how's work going? And you've got three or four things that pop into your mind, those are probably your KPIs. They're the things that if they are falling apart, you probably feel like things are falling apart. Uh, so these three or four things, you really want them also to be a mix of what we call leading and trailing indicators. Uh, really simply, a leading indicator is something that tells you how your business will be at the end of a period. And a trailing indicator is telling you how you did over that period. So when you are watching your KPIs, you want to have this mix of predictive indicators so we know the health of our business before we get to the end of the month. And you want to have those historical indicators that say, hey, we actually did well. And as you go through this process, these will actually reinforce each other and you can tweak and get better as you go forward. And so once we have those KPIs set, everything else can just fall into your exception reporting. This is where you set thresholds, and as long as the metrics stay within that range, you really don't need to worry about them. Obviously, we want you to take a look at them every now and then, but for your day-to-day -day data management, as long as everything is green, you're good to go. Uh, and KPIs and exception reportings play a really important role together. Um, my wife and I had our first almost a year ago. He's about to turn one year old, and uh, it has turned our life upside down, uh, particularly our, our chore rotation. Um, so we have really made Saturdays our day to just get things done. And one particular Saturday, we had a lot on our plate, you know, spring cleaning, all of that. And I asked, hey, what, what do we need to be focusing on today? Uh, I'm a list guy. And my wife, feeling overwhelmed, rightly so, uh, said, hey, just look around and pick something. Um, if you are married or living with a partner, uh, you have probably been on the receiving or the uh, telling end of this conversation. Um, and so I heard, all right, I'll go pick something that needs doing. And what I picked was the doorknob that was just a little wiggly downstairs and had been bothering me for a couple of weeks. And I ignored the sink full of bottles. Uh, so our KPI was, can we use the sink? Because the sink is a very important piece of our kitchen. The exception was the wiggly doorknob because the door was still working, it was latching, it was locking, it was just a little annoying. And when you've got butting heads with a KPI, so the sink or an exception, the doorknob, the sink really should have won. Uh, so set up your dashboards so that you can see both of these at the same time, but always focus on your KPIs. So we'll go to our next slide. Our next piece of this puzzle is turning information into action. And the reason we talk about turning information into action 
is that stopping at data into information is business knowledge. You can go really far with just understanding your data, but it's acting on that information that really turns it into intelligence. So once we have our KPI set, once we have our exception thresholds and reports, uh, we can make our critical business decisions faster and we can decrease that risk of failure that we talked about. And we can have that inertia actually work for us, not against us. Uh, this is where that, that Standish group really comes into play with paring down the decision-making process into those bite-sized chunks, the most important things. And turning that information into action also means automating processes. Uh, we're going to gain two really critical things uh, from automation, uh, setting standards across your business and gaining efficiency. And so efficiency feels like a pretty obvious thing for how automation can help. You know, right, we, we automate tasks that we do, and so we can turn our attention and our effort to other tasks that may not have been getting the attention they need. And standardization can feel a little less important to the equation. Uh, but if you really want to successfully implement business intelligence, clean data through standardization is critical. Uh, just a quick example of this, we work with a few CPA firms who have really strict reporting requirements on how many returns they do in a given state. Now, the problem that we came across was that when people were putting in new clients into the system and new returns, that they could type in anything for the state. So we had a few that were just the two letter abbreviation for the state. We had a few that were the older three letter abbreviation. And in that bucket, there was the some have periods, some don't. We had the full name of the state. And whenever you type in the full name of the state, there's probably going to be a few misspellings. So we're trying to help this client report on these returns so that they don't incur a, a pretty sizable fine. And it was just a nightmare. So we eventually figured it out. But on top of that, we automated the process to add states. So that whenever someone was adding a client, instead of being able to type something in, we now have a drop down that actually forces you to use our standard model of adding states. That way, next year, when we go back to do the same report, it's much simpler. And if we'll go to the next slide, we've talked about data into information and information into action. And this whole process is called a data maturity journey. Uh, we've got four buckets here. Not pictured is the very first one. That's data ignorance. Uh, we like to think that if you are on this webinar, that you are at least data aware. Uh, and we want to see everyone move through this process uh, through awareness, proficiency, savviness, to data-driven and even data-informed. Uh, data-driven is really, can feel like the end of the process. And that's where data is actually making decisions for you. And there's a place for that. But what we believe the final step of data maturity is, is called data-informed. And that's where we use the data to inform the decision-making process but we don't let it dictate everything that we do. And if you're like me, um, you don't really care about the NFL. Uh, if you're like my wife, you don't really care about the NFL, but you care a lot about Taylor Swift. Uh, so we watch the Super Bowl. And if you watch the Super Bowl in, in the fourth quarter, San Francisco was down by three points and had third and two on the 13 yard line. And the commentator even said, I would go for it on fourth down unless we lost a yard. San Francisco ended up losing that yard and they still went for it. On top of that, the play that they called went to their tight end who had been shut down the entire game. Everything about the data said, don't do this, kick the field goal, tie the game, you'll be fine. But the, 
San Francisco 49ers went for it. They converted the fourth down, and later they scored a critical touchdown that gave them the lead. So everything in the data was telling them, play it safe, play it safe, play it safe. You can go to overtime. What ended up happening is because they got that touchdown, uh, Kansas City drove it down and kicked that field goal. If they had played it safe, if they had listened to the data, they would have lost the game outright. Now they did end up losing, but they had many more chances because they went to overtime and because they ignored the data. So this final step of data maturity is having data to inform your decisions, knowing when to listen to it and when to ignore that. Uh, with all of that, you know, we've really looked at business intelligence, what it is, how we do it. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to David now so that we can actually talk through some practical examples of BI and governments. Thanks very much, Jeremy. Uh, yeah, in my household, we we didn't watch the Super Bowl. Uh, not, I'm much more of a car guy than a uh, football guy, but glad to have that analogy there. Uh, thanks for setting that foundation for us uh, of what business intelligence is and some of what it isn't. Uh, so yes, let's let's now start talking about practical examples of business intelligence within uh, governmental entities. Um, so this first um, slide that we're going to talk about is really just talking about the the big areas of business intelligence um, and some ways that they apply within governments. So maybe the most obvious area to look at first is reporting. I think that's what most people tend to um, tend to go to when they first think about business intelligence is, oh, hey, it's a pretty dashboard. We've got some great uh, information here for us to use. Uh, so we'll focus on that first. And thinking about reporting, you know, we've got kind of two ways to look at that. We've got our external reporting, especially for governmental entities. Uh, this looks different than it does for most businesses. So external reporting, you know, governments have a duty to report um, on how they're using taxpayer resources. Our local governments play a crucial role in the lives of citizens, providing essential services ranging from public safety and infrastructure development to education, even healthcare in some situations. And so all of these areas have reporting requirements and the communities uh, being served should have access to that information. So external reporting really is often um, a big uh, focus for municipal governments, but it's also something that's that's oftentimes uh, just provided to the public uh, through through the municipality's website. So BI can help with that tremendously. Uh, another focus area of reporting is really that internal focused reporting. So internal reporting focuses more on providing those key information pieces, uh, metrics to those responsible to make decisions or to take action on that information. So these are going to be our department heads, you know, city council, mayors, um, you know, police chief, wh whoever would be taking action on that information. So this could be something like budget versus actual reports, could be an overtime hours reports for a department head. Maybe it's maintenance exceptions for garage operations or any number of other reports, but these would be internally focused reports, helping us uh, really manage our organization better. So these reports must be aligned with the goals and the processes that are already established for the entity. So internal reporting is critical for that smooth functioning of the organization. Uh, in addition to reporting, we'll also touch on a few examples in the automation and the data cleanup side of things to help us round out this discussion of how BI can be leveraged um, within local governments. And with that, I think we can go to the next slide. All right. So this first example, and I, I like this one a lot. So. Um, this first example of external reporting really does focus on citizen engagement. Uh, that's one that municipalities care about a lot. So making useful information available to the public, it's a crucial um, aspect of um, 
providing that transparency and accountability and citizen engagement within our local governments. So by, by providing access to relevant data and insights, governments can build trust, can enhance civic engagement, and encourage collaboration in decision-making processes. Additionally, making information accessible to the public just enhances the government's legitimacy and promotes a more involved and connected society. So this first example is, um, is from Kings County, or King County, Washington. Um, it's really a great example of using a map um, and then adding some technology to that um, to provide um, a, a great tool for their, their citizen group. So as a dad of five kids, uh, I also find this to be a great tool because um, my kids, we all love being outdoors, but we each have different interests. And sometimes uh, those interests, like I'd like to be able to go somewhere where I can you know, knock out two or three of the kids' uh, interests in one park. So you can see on the left-hand side, they've, they've added a, um, a filtering tool so that you can you know, put in, hey, I need one that has a playground, but I also want to make sure it's got tennis uh, and we need to have fishing. So uh, adding in these different um, activities as a filter allows the users to benefit from the work that the, the county has done on the back end of really making all of that information available and accessible to them. I mean, think about if you were trying to go through this in, you know, the, the typical way that you find parks, you know, they're listed in alphabetical order, or maybe they've got a map and you can, you know, filter by the ones that are closest to you, but you don't have a great way to be able to really slice that information in a most useful way to you. So this is a great example of uh, using business intelligence to really improve the, the usefulness of this report um, for the for the citizens. All right, we'll move on to the next slide. This one might be the most boring report that I'm going to show. Um, it's probably no need for introduction here. I mean, re revenue and spending reporting is required for all governmental entities. Um, transparent governance really does strengthen democracy. Um, it, it enables our citizens to hold officials accountable for their actions and ensure that public resources are used effectively and, and responsibly uh, to meet the community needs. So this report, you know, on the surface, we look at it and say, all right, this is, yeah, this is a basic you know, line, line graph. We get it. But really, we could spend the entire rest of this webinar just talking about how BI can drastically improve financial reporting function within governments. I want to touch on just six ways um, quickly, um, but this is just, just a brief overview of some of those areas. So one, especially within governments and large organizations, we have so many sources of data. And that data has relevance, it has importance. Um, but using business intelligence um, can really allow us to integrate those data, that data from multiple sources, whether it's the accounting system, budgeting software, inventory management, procurement, whatever, into a centralized platform that allows us to then be able to consolidate that financial data uh, and streamline the reporting process. It reduces manual errors, it ensures consistency and accuracy of our financial reports. Additionally, by doing the work of setting up and using business intelligence tools for this, we get real-time reporting. So BI services enable us to um, achieve real-time access to that financial data. That means that when we're generating reports on budgetary performance or revenue trends or expenditures, it's, it's current information. It's as current as the data that we have. Uh, so this timely reporting facilitates more informed decision making um, because it's up to date. It's insights on current activity, the current health of the organization, uh, and not last year's information from the CAFR. Um, next, uh, data visualiz visualization. Uh, sorry, not next slide yet. Uh, data visualization and dashboards, uh, BI tools 
do offer sophisticated data visualization. Uh, this is a very simplified visualization that we're showing right now, uh, but it allows for so much interactivity. So we can add filters, we can add slicers, we can make complex um, uh, requirements for these reports and have them be able to be produced quickly and, um, and in a way that it tells the story of how we're doing. Um, compliance and regulatory reporting. Obviously, if we've got all of this information, um, BI services can help automate a lot of that compliance and regulatory reporting. Um, just so that it ensures that we are um, adhering to financial regulations and the standards. So these tools can generate those standardized reports, um, such as financial statements or audit trails, um, while facilitating also the internal controls and the audit process. Um, cost optimization and efficiency is another big area where BI can help. Um, because we're able to analyze spending patterns or identify inefficiencies and optimize costs across departments or across programs, um, BI tools uh, can help tremendously in facilitating um, cost efficiencies. So by gaining those insights into cost drivers and performance metrics, governments can make data-driven decisions uh, or better data-informed decisions to allocate resources more effectively and improve financial sustainability to achieve our budgetary goals. And finally, it's just that enhanced decision making. Um, when using BI services, they, they really do provide decision makers with comprehensive financial insights and analytics that enable them to make more informed decisions aligned with strategic objectives. So by accessing accurate and timely information, government leaders can prioritize investments, they can provide prioritize different programs or evaluate the program's performance and allocate resources accordingly. All right now we can move to the next slide. All right, so with this um, next slide, this is just a great example, and I know we've covered a good bit, and I'm going to touch on these next few slides um, pretty quickly. But this, again, is just another great example of using a map to provide information. So this is voter turnout for the 2022 general election. Again, this is from King County. Um, and so when you go back to your organizations, what we want is for you to start thinking outside the box about how you can utilize BI. What are the things that, um, that presenting your data in a way like this um, can impact others? So for this, showing the voter turnout for the different voter precincts, it's a great way to inform the public and encourage that public participation in government. It, it can also be used to inform other groups or nonprofits about where to focus their efforts to engage the public and get people out and voting. Next slide. All right, another simple bar chart, um, nothing fancy here, um, but I wanted to just show that even in simple charts like this, the, the data that you can derive is powerful. So this is an example of a report uh, this, it's not complicated, but this is the report that's used to help inform city management regarding hiring needs and their building inspectors. So this information gave them the insights that they needed to increase budgets for hiring electrical inspectors because of how high the demand was and how, high, how big the backlog was. So again, data to insights and turning those insights into actions. That's what we're all about um, when we're talking about BI. And don't forget the poll questions in case you're uh, trying to get your CPE. All right, next slide. All right. So for this next slide, we're looking at, um, really this is where I wanted to bring up the power of bringing in multiple sources of data. Um, so this is a great example of looking at multiple sources of data and bringing it together on a single report. So most of our standard reports out of um, just the, the standard software that we're using um, within our governments can only pull the information from that system. They don't have the ability to pull in information from other systems. But often it's very helpful to see information compared to other information from another system. So in this case, we're bringing in business license data 
from one system and joining it to crime data from another system. Uh, we're able to then see this side-by-side -side information from these different systems and begin to dig into the trends. Um, so when we talk about um, data warehousing and implementation in a moment, um, this is where that value of implementing BI really does shine. Uh, being able to combine several data sets and summarize by those common attributes is a huge win for any organization and really especially for governmental entities because we've got such um, disparate systems within most of our governments. All right, next slide. All right, so one, one more um, just uh, example of BI in, in practice. Uh, this one is from our, our friends next door over in Mississippi. Uh, so bringing in this information from MDOT, they were able to prepare this compelling map of bridge infrastructure that needs attention. So this is information um, that can be utilized in prioritizing existing funds, um, tracking progress over time, but also for applying for additional funds to improve the state's bridge infrastructure. So visuals like this can tell a really compelling story and help your municipality uh, win additional grants or get increased allocations. So, all right, next slide. All right, so I could probably also talk all day on uh, some of these different projects that we've done. But just wanted to talk through a few, get your mind thinking about what um, automations and, um, and data integrity could look like within your organization uh, as we just talk through a, a couple of different um, scenarios where projects that we've done in the past. Uh, this first one, delinquent business licenses, uh, worked with a, with a local municipality um, to really help them identify. They had a couple of different data sources. They had changed systems and had... Um, some, some bad conversion um, experience there, but to be able to go back and clean out their um, data sets and combine those to be able to show, hey, wh which businesses were delinquent or hadn't um, paid their business licenses um, over the past three years, combine that together so that instead of, you know, one person going through the, the you know, 2020 information and one person going through 2021 information um, or so forth, they were able to have that all combined and see on, on a single dashboard, here's all the um, people who are delinquent and then filter it down and see, all right, who's delinquent within this area? And we give them, you know, it's, it's three years of delinquency or it's, um, you know, just the first and the third year of delinquency. So it's a really, really helpful tool to help them get back on track because before with the manual processes that they had, the information just wasn't reportable, it wasn't reportable out of their systems. They didn't have a good clean way to be able to show that. Um, next, um, automatic bank reconciliations. Obviously, if, if you're in a governmental entity and you've had the, uh, the challenging task of reconciling uh, some of these larger bank accounts, um, just the volume of transactions can be daunting to go through. And so being able to take the information from a bank download and compare it to the information from the GL and automatically map those and then just spit out, here's the exceptions, here's the ones that couldn't be matched on whatever variety of criteria. And to be able to then give the person who's doing the reconciliation, all right, here's all of your items that that need to be addressed. Instead of having to go through and spend the you know hours of time um, just ticking and tying and hoping that you didn't get off a line and 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 miss one or accidentally tick the wrong line, um, now they have a clear uh, picture of here's the ones that are outstanding that still need reconciliation work. Data cleanup, again, this is a, a broad topic. We run into this often, um, whether it's in municipal work or whether it's in um, our, our work with other businesses. But a, a lot of times these are you know, one-time automation tasks where we take thousands or millions of rows of data. Uh, we pass it through a cleanup process you know, based on information given from the, the client and then feed it back into their system so that 
when they run the reports out of the system, they actually get the information they're expecting uh, to have. And so that's, um, that's a very uh, broad and uh, large overview of that, but uh, it's a huge help when we're trying to really start making BI um, reporting and automations work is getting that data cleanup process. And so it is an automation, but it's an automation that supports the rest of the automations. Uh, and then the last one I would say is just the uh, time entry and team leaderboards. Uh, I, I used to uh, run shop operations for a, uh, a fire truck company. And so uh, in doing that, um, there's a lot, we worked a lot with municipalities as well, obviously, since they're pretty much the only ones buying fire trucks. Um, and so we worked with a lot of um, municipal shops as well. And so one of the things that we learned in our shop was um, that time entry and um, really productivity on the shop floor uh, was something that was hard to manage. It was hard, hard to keep track on because of the, just the volume of work coming through the shop. And so um, for us, that leaderboard that we created provided this friendly competition among the teams, but it also informed us of the status on the projects, bay downtime, average turn time, or over and under budgets by the teams. Um, in order to facilitate that level of reporting, we, we had to upgrade our time clock system and really integrate that into our project management system. Uh, that wasn't a small task, but it paid tremendous dividends in terms of shop performance and transparency. Uh, and that's one of those things we often see uh, when working with municipalities or businesses in general is um, this this need to um, make sure that we've that we're getting the right data in order for us to be able to report what we're trying to report on. All right, last slide for me, uh, and I'll try to trim this down a little bit more so I'm not running too far over my allotted time. Uh, but really, I just wanna talk about data warehousing. We mentioned it a couple of times in here, but really data warehousing is this bringing together of all of your different sources of data making the manipulations that need to be made, structuring it in the way that it needs to be structured, and then presenting it based on the needs of the end user. So whether that's presenting it into an automation process or whether that's presenting it into reporting that's gonna be external facing and you know, very highly structured and very limited, or if it's you know, feeding into a, a further analysis, you know, it, it, allowing it to go to our department heads for them to uh, really build out and ask questions of the data and get get better information digging deep into the data. But a data warehouse is really where um, all of that kind of magic happens in the back end. So it's, it's often the critical component for really getting a tool um, that, that supports the needs of the user base um, at the end of the day. So benefits of a data warehouse is it combines those Data, uh, multiple data sources, but it also handles structured data or semi-structured data or unstructured data. It, really what that means is you can feed all kinds of things into a data warehouse. Uh, and then uh, once it's there, make the determination of, all right, how is this gonna be used? It can house very, very large data sets, which that's a, a critical component for most of our governmental um, clients they just have tremendous amounts of data. It also enhances the security um, by, by managing it through a data warehouse. You can um, have very strict controls over who has access to what data. You can really kind of feed that out there in the, the reporting layer, that visualization and reporting layer. Um, it, it also allows for a lot greater analysis. Just we can, we can do a lot more once the data is in a data warehouse and then retrieving that data easily for reporting and visual, visualization. It's much easier to pull it from a, a well-designed data warehouse than it is to try to pull it even most of the time from those individual systems um, for the original data sources. So as we talk about uh, data warehousing, uh, I think I'm gonna probably skip. I had some implementation strategies as well, but I don't wanna take up any more of Mindy's time. So. Uh, I will stop there and turn it over to Mindy, I believe, or, or at least back to Jenny.
Yeah, thank you so much for that, uh, Jeremy and David. I have learned stuff and now I kind of want to go out and look at some crime and infrastructure maps that are available out there. Um, but we're going to have uh, next, um, now that we've kind of heard what the definition of business intelligence is and, you know, ways that you can use, um, you can use it to kind of house your data and, and make decisions. We're going to hear from somebody who is um, on the decision making end of uh, of the business intelligence for governmental entities. And it's Mindy Wyatt. And she is, um, like I said, she's with the city of Hoover. So uh, Mindy, can you just uh, tell us a little bit about how um, you've used uh, business intelligence and, uh, and, and worked with Abacus, um, you know, for the city of Hoover? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, Thank you guys so much for having me. I always enjoy working with Abacus. They are great partners of ours. And uh, as I told Jeremy earlier, I really like getting on the calls with them and kind of nerding out a little bit. Um, it's always enjoyable to talk to someone who really understands data and how that works together and how important it is to the organization. So like Jenny said, I'm going to be going through uh, really kind of the applied side of business intelligence and data strategy overall. Um, so I kind of have four things that I'd like to cover with you. Uh, hopefully I won't be going too fast and I will give you fair warning. My slides are not nearly as pretty as Abacus's um, because I am kind of winging it based on a lot of different materials that I wanted to pull together for you guys today. So uh, what I'd like to talk about is that data strategy and, and business intelligence in practice and just go through briefly two different use cases that I have in mind talk a little bit about our data strategy at the city and how it provides underlying support for our operations, our projects, and our strategic planning. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about data strategy from the technical perspective, and then I'll share with you some tools and resources that I have come across as part of this learning journey that I myself have been on. So with that in mind, um, I want to lead off with something that Jeremy pointed out, and he said, you know, data is one of the many tools that we have in our in our toolbox and it's not necessarily giving you the entire answer but it does lead you to what questions you need to ask and where to look for issues and things so I kind of liken it to finding a flashlight when the power's out and you've got a thousand Legos in the floor that your kid left and you're really trying hard not to step on them flashlight is that data and if you can really begin to use that data, then it tells you where to look so you don't step on the Legos, right? So that's my fun analogy for the day. So let's just get into data strategy and business intelligence in practice. Uh, I have two use cases to go over with you. The first one is for our fleet department, and the second one is for our parks and recreation department. So we'll start with fleet, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and like I said, I don't have a nice fancy presentation, but I just have a few different materials that I pulled up that I'd like to share with you guys. So this is the work plan that we worked with with Abacus to take a deeper dive into our fleet data. And I'll tell you what the reason were the impetus for doing this project. We are coming off of a legacy system uh, if you're a municipal client, you may have heard of HTE or SunGuard or Central Square. It's been a prominent player in the market for many, many years. Um, we have been on the system since 1994. Uh, change is a little hard. And so we were just very slow to get off of this old green screen, uh, no graphical interface system. And so as we're doing that, Obviously, we, we know we have to do this, right? And so we had identified a product for the financial side of the house. We had not identified a product for the community side of the house or your operational side of the house, which includes things like engineering and fleet and uh, building inspections and those types of things that we all do in a municipality. So we really needed to understand our fuel usage. We needed to understand our parts and how we purchase parts. We needed to understand the life cycle of our vehicles. Uh, how do we perform work in the fleet department? So we really just kind of wanted to take all things fleet and just kind of pick them up like a cube and look at it from as many angles as we could to see what insights that we could gather. 
And so what you're seeing on the screen is the work plan that uh, we came up with between the city and between Abacus. And you can see some of the different steps that we took and some of the things that we were trying to work through. So we just started with some basic data gathering and we really wanted to see what do we have? Um, you don't know exactly where you need to go with these types of projects until you figure out what information that you already have that you can actually use. So the first step is always this discovery phase. Then we wanted to take a look at our parts. Uh, we wanted to identify what parts we have in inventory, what parts are we using, um, how do we use those parts, how do they align to the different vehicles, how many different vehicles do we have, how many um, different makes and models do we have, how old is our fleet. Um, this also came with a full fleet touch audit, and I can assure you we have some very, 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 very old vehicles that probably shouldn't be on the road. And if Alabama had an inspection, they might not pass. That's how old some of these things were. Um, so we got to kind of use that data. And then you can see the data source that we have there. Um, so HTE is that legacy system. It had a lot of information for fleet. We use that system to track work orders and parts usage and maintenance and things like that. So the majority of our records were in that system called HTE. O'Reilly's was one of the major vendors that we purchased parts from. So we wanted to get their data and begin to compare that. We also looked at fuel consumption and you can see that data there. We had fuel man and then we needed a vehicle listing. So we kind of began to identify all of the different parts and pieces that we needed for this particular project. Um, and you can see all of those things that we took through. And then you'll notice um, lines two through eight are really all about those analyzing those different components. And so when we talk about taking the data and looking at it from all these different angles, those are all those different angles that you wanna look at those, at that data set from and begin to tie those things together for valuable insights. But that last one is called KPI and benchmarking. And that was, again, a way to begin to look at how do we gauge the level of service that we're providing for ourselves, for our citizens. And we also have a shared usage agreement with another nearby municipality where we actually provide fleet services and we bill them for actual cost. So we have a lot of accountability that we need to provide to our management team, to our citizens, to our customers, and our customers are internal and external. So that's why we decided to add KPIs to the end of that phase. So that was the duration of the project. Um, and it was very valuable to walk through this process with Abacus. Um, I know enough to be really dangerous with data analytics and, and things like that, uh, but Jeremy and their team uh, really just helped look at some of this data. Some of this data was very hard to tie together. We had some very unique challenges that being able to work through those issues with them uh, was extremely valuable. The biggest challenge I can think of is that the purchasing data coming out of our new purchasing system, the parts were listed by a reform description field instead of a part number. And so not having that indexed made that very difficult to do some of the analysis that we needed to do. So a big part of your data strategy needs to be that you're putting good data in. And you always want to think about when you're setting up a system and when you're setting up a data strategy, what do you want to get out of the system? So the better you can do on the front end when you are working with your software, the easier your reporting is going to be on the back end and the easier it's going to be to be able to draw these conclusions. So with that in mind, um, I want to show you a couple of things that we were doing with our KPI and benchmarking for both fleet and for parks and rec, and that'll kind of walk us into our next use case. So this is a, an example of a KPI dashboard that we have created for fleet. Um, we kept these on our public facing website and I apologize, I should have pulled one from December instead of January. So it was already filled out for the year because it looks much more interesting when you have a year's worth of data. 
this is a PDF of the dashboard. Um, I thought it too risky to try to do the interactive on a live webinar. So um, this is done through Tableau and we did make them available for on our website for a time. Um, they're actually probably still out there, but I don't believe that they are up to date. We've had some changes where uh, we've kind of fallen by the wayside of doing this and hope to get back to it soon. So that's my disclaimer if you go out to our website and uh, look for those and don't find them. But what we were able to do is in the interactive dashboard, you're able to mouse over these things. If you're familiar with Tableau, then it will pop up with some additional information. And as you begin to see all of these things filled out, uh, they are much more interesting. And what we're able to do here, like we're able to compare the work we do for Pelham versus the work we do internally for uh, Hoover's service volume. Here's our fuel usage. How many gallons of diesel are we using versus how many gallons of gas? So these are just kind of operational metrics and um, they help us gauge how we're doing overall. We started out very basic with our KPIs and uh, with in mind of being able to just get something basic for the public that managers may be able to use and really, really want to beef up this particular aspect of what we're doing. It is now baked into a more full-blown data strategy. And I'll share that with you guys in just a minute. I wanna show you our events and recreation dashboard. And this is actually a trend analysis. So these were not public dashboards, but um, this is really kind of a, I think a year and a half analysis of the data. And what this allowed us to do is, is for me to go in and analyze these trends and turn it into meaningful information so that we could then make management decisions. So this is really the crux of what you're trying to do with a business intelligence solution. So if you look at um, just this panel here, this recreation center visitors, and I'll try to make this a little larger for you guys. Um, let's see here, bear with me. And then we'll go this way for just a minute. Okay, so everybody noticed that nice big red line. Um, I know uh, I didn't have a poll or I don't have great feedback, but I'm pretty sure that everybody can guess that that was when COVID hit. So these are our recreation center visitors and you can tell pre-COVID we're just floating along, not a lot of variation there. And then COVID hit, so we had no visitors. You can tell when we shut down. And then if you notice post COVID, we really were not recovering like we should have and like we expected to. And so you've got this steep decline in this trend and we're well below the average. And so you begin to look at this and think, okay, what do we need to do? Um, what do we need to look at? And so we turned this data into uh, just kind of a management report. And again, this just tells us what else do we need to look at? And so you can see average attendance pre-COVID was flat, averaged about 15,000 a month. Post-COVID, there's a slight increase, but the average is around 8,500 a month. So the 2021 numbers are currently at 31 point, or 31% of the 2019 levels and 58% of the 2020 levels. So again, it just tells us that we're not really recovering as fast as we would like to. So what did all this lead to? It actually led to the creation of our Parks and Public Spaces Plan, which I'm happy to say just uh, was adopted by two of our boards this past week, and we hope to have it adopted by council uh, next week. This was a year and a half uh, long process for this plan, and this plan helps cast a vision for the next 20 years of Parks and Recreation and Trails in Hoover. And one of the ways that we could show how important that plan was to create was this data here. Again, it wasn't the final thing and it wasn't the only thing, but it was a tool that we could use in our business case to go in and say, hey, we really need to figure out who we are with Parks and Recreation what is the rec center? What does it need to be? Are we serving the right customers? What do we need to do? And so all of that, again, this was a tool that led to a management decision 
that led to the creation of a strategic plan, long-term vision for parks and recreation. So with uh, that, I wanna get into kind of the data strategy for the, just the BI process. And so I kind of wanted to just briefly show you this document. This really begins to speak more to performance measurements and how we intend to kind of tackle it as a government entity. And this was put together through just a couple of different resources that I found. And I'm not going to belabor it or anything. And I'm happy to share this. I'll share any information that I can with anybody who's interested in uh, reviewing it and using what you can from it. But these are our different types of performance measures that we have. You've got your operational things. Those are things that serve um, your demand, your performance, the quality, what type of service level are we providing? Just in our day-to-day -day operations, how are we doing? This is really good for your department heads and your managers, your project measures. Um, so one of the things that I do, I'm a, a PMP project management professional. And when you are creating projects and you're creating those business cases, you create a project to address an issue or solve a problem or produce something. And how do you know if your project is producing the thing that you need it to produce? Well, one of the ways that you do that is when you actually initiate the project, you also go ahead and develop the metrics that you're going to use to measure whether or not your project was successful. And so I'll give you an example of that. We are uh, kicking off a payroll timepiece implementation project. And one of the things I asked the team in the kickoff meeting is, how are you going to define success on this project? And so we all went around the room and the best answer I heard was that the payroll clerk gets to go on vacation without having to worry about whether or not payroll was going to be able to be processed without her being there. Um, that is one of the best measurements that I have ever found. And I intend to use that. Um, that is going to be the measurement of whether or not that project was successful is if our payroll clerk can go forth and go on vacation and not have to worry. Um, our strategic measures. So um, in an organization, you kind of have your strategic plan and then you have your uh, project management plans. So your project management plans should support your strategic plan, but underlying both of those things are all of your data and your information. So just as you do in a project plan, you also need to include measures in your strategic plans. And those can either be KPIs or they can be uh, organizational key results called OKRs. And I'll give you all some information on some of those tools in just a moment. Um, then you've got your public facing measures. These are things that particularly in government, we wanna be transparent. We want to inform the public of how we're doing and how their tax dollars are being used. You have your C-suite measures and the C-suite is just your, your high level management team, your uh, kind of your core executive team, your mayor, your council, um, any of your high ranking officials that are uh, making those decisions. And then you have one off reports. Um, don't ever leave this out of your data plan because you are always going to need to be able to do ad hoc reports. And the reason this is so important is we often keep reporting. It's very technical and it is a skill in and of itself, but as much as possible, you want to empower the rest of your organization to be able to create reports for themselves. We're beginning to see that in some of the new systems and they have made a lot of strides, but we're still not where we need to be. So again, I'm not going to belabor this entire uh, document here. I'm happy to share it, but you kind of get into the different types of metrics and how they relate. And this kind of begins to get into the uh, technical components. So this begins to shift into the data strategy from a technical perspective. Um, we talk about why, we talk about what. Now we're kind of beginning to shift into talk about how. So I know David talked about a, David, a, a data warehouse and the importance of that. Um, you can see some of the advantages that, that we identified. You've got to have that data that's cleaned and standardized and, and things like that. Here's my cliff notes on why you need a data warehouse or some sort of solution. In any organization, um, I'm sure government is no different. Um, 
well, let me back up and say this. Somebody once told me that managing a government organization is like having 15 to 20 different companies under one umbrella because each unit of the government has a different function. And so if you begin to think of them as different functionalities, they all need a different piece of software. We are in the era where we are automating and digitizing and applying an app to everything. So the amount of systems that we have to deal with is only increasing. And we find that we have to get very specialized systems for very specialized uses. And so as a part of that, or as a result of that, we have all of these siloed cans of data sitting around. Well, how do I give that to somebody in finance who is really good at Excel, but they might not necessarily be great at writing a connection string to connect to all of these different types of data. And you can get really technical with some of that and it becomes very difficult even for people who are seasoned uh, technical people. Writing a connection string is probably uh, the bane of most people's existence because you get one comma out of place and you can spend hours and hours and hours troubleshooting it. And that is not where we want the other people to focus their time. So a data warehouse allows us to hopefully pull all of this data together. And then instead of teaching people how to use 10 different tools, only have to teach them how to use one tool. And then hopefully a good one would allow them to bring their tool of choice. So if they like Excel, they can use Excel to get to this data. If they like Power BI, they can use Power BI to get to this data. If they like Tableau, they can use Tableau to get to this data. Whatever tool they enjoy using and are most comfortable with, a well-designed data warehouse will help them connect to that data, use the tool they're comfortable with, and go on about their business and be able to take this data and make decisions and make meaningful decisions. Um, so we talked about the analytics software. Um, this just kind of gets into the stages of uh, development. So we'll skip over that. But performance measurement as a practice. So we really need to start, if you're developing a performance measurement plan, you need to identify what those measures are. You need to figure out how you're going to track them. Again, good data in, good data out and make sure that you're optimizing that data. So this is all about that data cleanup and some of those things. The more you can clean up in your systems, the better off you are. Then you have those measurement collections. So how do we collect that data? Um, ideally, we automate it. You definitely don't wanna have to do manual process. It's very consuming. And then we get into our reporting. And then, um, a lot of times we wind up stopping at measurement reporting. We're like, oh man, we're collecting all this data. This is great. One of the biggest and earliest challenges that I had was being able to sit the management team down and say, okay, you have all this data. Here's what it means. And if you don't be intentional about setting aside the time for this regular review of performance measures, then you're gathering it for nothing. So don't get into the habit of gathering data just to gather data. This is all beautiful and it's fun and it's interesting and it's great to have these insights. But if you are not using them to make decisions, you are wasting your time. So this is kind of a use case that I came up with. Again, I'm not gonna belabor this. Um, we'll go through um, a couple of other tools for you. So that kind of covers data strategy and business intelligence in practice. We talked about the fleet case. We talked about parks and recreation, talked a little bit about data strategy from a BI perspective and then from a technical perspective. And then I wanna take you through some tools and resources that I have come up with and that have been very valuable to me. So I do not have links, but these are both available from Amazon. David Ammons is an author out of uh, UNC, and uh, he has probably been the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable resource that I have found. Uh, these are great books. I highly, highly, highly recommend them if you are starting out on BI and performance measurements. So I actually have them, actually I'm blurred so you can't see them, but you can see them on the screen there. Um, and then I wanna talk a little bit about those KPIs and the metrics and stuff. And so this is a great uh, slide here. All metrics, all KPIs are metrics, but all metrics are not KPIs. 
So you can kind of see the differences there. Um, some of those examples down here, um, pre-sales KPIs, customer success KPIs, um, and conversations in the last two weeks, deals lost last quarter. Um, that out of the way. So that's kind of a, a little bit of a delineation. Uh, you can have and collect many metrics. You can really overkill on some of this. So one of the key things that we started doing is to identify what those metrics are and then what's important. So this is an example of what we've gathered up for Fleet. I relied heavily on the resources from uh, David Ammons. I also looked at um, industry organizations. So you'll see this NAFA down here. Uh, I think it's National Association for Fleet Administration or something akin to that. Um, they had a good bit of resources on their website. You can find all kinds of professional references that give you a great idea of the different types of measurements and metrics that you could track. We are not going to track all of these. I don't recommend tracking all of these. This was a starting point of what's important, how easy is it to collect, and where in a phase should it be. So you'll see some phase ones over here. And then you'll see some, um, and I didn't include those in this particular screenshot, but some of those I actually went ahead and made a recommendation that we don't ever need to track this. So I told you a little bit about um, the differences between data and business intelligence for um, operational. And then you've got uh, some of these things that are tied to more strategic planning. These are very interchangeable. Um, there's, there's kind of some gray, there's, there's not necessarily one is better than the other. I think some of them have different tools and different uses, but OKR stands for Organization Key Objectives, or no, Objectives and Key Results, sorry. Um, so this kind of in my mind is more related to strategic planning, whereas these are more related to operational and day-to-day -day type things. But it doesn't say that you can't use KPIs in strategic plans or that you can't use OKRs in some of your project management plans and, and that type of thing. Um, again, here's an example of an objective and key results. So if you want to improve collaboration and communication across your teams, then your key result might be that you hold two meetings per month and communicate those expectations. Uh, if you were to turn that into a KPI, then these could be your KPIs on this side, but this is the reason that you're tracking those KPIs. So there's there's kind of a, a gray line between these two things. And you've also probably heard of balanced scorecard. It's another, I guess, uh, theory and uh, tool that you can use in part of your data strategy. Again, the goal being is to put good data in, have a good process for getting data out, and then use that data and use that business intelligence to begin to create change in your organization. Because if you're not using it to help with decisions, then you are not achieving your results there. So some other resources that I have found very useful is Mecklenburg County. They are a great organization to benchmark for strategic planning and then tying those metrics and OKRs to strategic plans. The Project Management Institute, if you study their program management, they have an increasing focus on how project plans should support strategic plans and that how all of those should be supported by data metrics, such as the KPIs and the OKRs. Association for Strategic, strategic Planning has a government body of practice. Um, and then those industry organizations and publications. Um, so like I said, I know this is not about strategic planning. <clears throat> this is about data and a data strategy and business intelligence. But business intelligence is gonna help you across all areas of your organization, whether it's organizational, um, whether it's public facing measurements, whether it's management measure measurements, or just those one-off reportings and deeper dives that you need to do. So thank you guys very much for having me and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Mindy, thank you so much. Um, that was wonderful. Um, 
it's always very interesting to me to to look at data and to look and see how it can be used to make decisions. Um, and I, I guess we're about to start our Q&A session, um, but I wanted to kind of kick back to to Jeremy and David and, and just ask, you know, I know you guys were really involved in helping with this project um, for the city of Hoover with, with some of their projects. Um, can you guys kind of just describe, you know, other ways that you can use business intelligence or how you can, you know, kind of use it to help other clients? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll let Jeremy jump in as well. But um, yeah, business intelligence, and Mindy hit on this. Uh, great, they're right towards the end as well. But it really is there to support. It's not there for data's sake. We're, we're not doing, uh, you know, we're not doing business intelligence work um, just to say, all right, now we can wave our hand over it and we have all these, you know, wonderful numbers and they're balanced and they're in pretty reports. It's there to support making those good business decisions or good municipal government decisions that will help us achieve those goals. What's our strategic vision? What are we trying to accomplish? And how do we know whether we've done that or not? And so absolutely, there's lots of ways that we can apply that. And it can be, you know, in that granular method, you know, where we're looking at, you know, one subset of a department and we're looking at, all right, how can we help this one, you know, small group achieve what they're trying to achieve? Or it can be across an entire organization where you're pulling in all kinds of information. And I'll let Jeremy hit that as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo what David and Mindy have, have said, you know, um, your, your business in, is creating data, whether you like it or not, it's there. Uh, and if you want to get started, I think the best way to get started is just whatever question you have about how things are going, you can find a data point to inform that. And whether that's going back to our data maturity journey, uh, whether that's just a simple Excel report that helps you wrap your mind around it, or you've got the capacity to build an entire Tableau suite that Mindy showed us, and it's you know more automated like that. Uh, just asking the question and knowing if I really want to answer this question, I know the data is out there is a great place to start. Um, and you know, obviously we're here to help you, but the resources that Mindy showed you as well, uh, we've, we've thumbed through those and they, uh, they are dense, but they are really, really good. Uh, awesome. Um, and Mindy, I, I have a question for you. Um, I know that, you know, something that kind of all of us suffer from it at one time or another is decision fatigue and, you know, feeling like you're having to make so many decisions. Um, and obviously I think that, you know, using business intelligence and, you know, working in a partnership with a company like Abacus to kind of design that um, kind of alleviates that decision fatigue. How do you uh, with so many different things going on in a city and having so many people that you answer to, you know, being the public, department heads, you know, budgets, um, the governing body, like how do you uh, go about prioritizing um, what projects you're going to to take on, um, you know, for, for anything that you know that you're going to need to get that data to make decisions about, how do you prioritize that? You know, I think the first step in any any project whether it's data or you're using data to support the project is getting the right people on board getting the right experts in the room there is not a single person that uh, can know everything that there is that uh, you need to know you also have capacity issues um, which you know we really struggle with because we're all wearing different hats uh, many times so First, get the right people in the room. And then second, um, start with the end in mind. When you're planning some of these projects, think about what you want to get out of it. So if you're setting up a new system, 
when before you ever sit down to enter in all of your setup and your configuration, you need to figure out what data do I need out of this? Because that helps you design and figure out what you put into it. The other thing I would say is figure out who your stakeholders are. Um, not only do you need the right people on the project team, uh, people like Abacus who really know what to do and know the technical aspects of it. Uh, there were some things that uh, Jeremy knew that I could not have done in-house. Uh, I just don't have that particular skill set. So it was great to have them on the team. Um, having Dalton come on and help organize the work plan that I showed you guys. All of those things were great to not only help with technical ex expertise, but capacity. But the other thing that is so, so important is to identify who your stakeholders are. Um, and it depends on what you're doing, but that could be your management team. That could be, in some cases, your citizens. Um, it can run the gamut, and it's going to vary on what you're doing. But have a stakeholder brainstorming session. You will not regret it. Okay. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, so I want to open it up so that if anybody, you know, that's in attendance has a question for um, for Jeremy and David or for, for Mindy, um, if y'all want to just chat those into the q and I'll um, not be able to provide a business intelligence answer, but I will be able to read it off. So I'm going to open, open that up now. Make sure you hit your polling question there. So if no one has any questions, oh wait, oh, we have oh we have two. Okay. Um <clears throat> oh we have so many questions. I'm so excited. Um, okay, what does the process look like for getting started with BI with Abacus? I'll toss that to, to David. Yep, thank you. Trying to find my mute button. Uh, yeah, so the process uh, with us, uh, obviously it's going to start with uh, just that initial meeting to uh, kind of understand what you're looking for, what a client would be looking for. Uh, but then once we've kind of established that um, from the initial meeting, we go through a discovery process and that's understanding the data sources, you know, the requirements um, of the project. And from there, we're able to actually put together really the, the roadmap of what would it take to um, to get to that endpoint that you're looking for? So it's going to be you know different for each um, client. You know what what all those um, kind of pieces look like, but that's the general roadmap of what that um, what that process takes. So okay, awesome. Uh, and then this one I think uh, is for you, Mindy. How do you create buy-in at the city? I know um, that it can be difficult to sometimes get people on board because, you know, even with business intelligence, it, that might be viewed as change. But um, how do you get people? How do you get people to buy in to uh, to the process at like at the city? Yeah, I will say uh, city's probably not unique, but I say it often and I say it loud. Change is hard, um, and it's particularly hard in an organization where. People tend to work for very long periods of time. I'm in my 24th year at the city and uh, I am not the youngest person here. So change is hard. How do you create buy-in? Uh, you build that consensus by including your stakeholders. Stakeholder management is key. Have a champion that is going to help promote this. And I'm going to be honest, you have to have somebody in authority who is going to be that champion because they've got to give it that level of gravitas in order to get it carried out at the organization. Because particularly in the beginning, if someone doesn't see the value in what you're doing, then they're not going to go through the work to get that information for you that you might need from them. So stakeholder management, and I will end that with saying informing is not the same thing as including make sure you include your stakeholders, not just inform them. Okay. Uh, next, do you have a, a tool of choice in presenting results? I know you had talked about, you know, different ways that you can kind of manage data and use an, some people use Excel or, or have a platform. 
Um, but do you have a, a choice um, in how you present the data or the results? For myself, um, I really like Tableau for dashboards and visualization. Um, I think it depends on the tool that you learn and that you're most comfortable with. But there are plenty of times where I probably spend 75% of my day in Excel doing pivot tables and things like that. And um, I'll give you an example. We're looking at some financial analysis right now with our new CFO and our uh, former city treasurer who's retired and come back to do some help. And we're literally sitting in a conference room going through pivot tables and I'm changing the pivot tables live as they're asking questions. So some of this in this particular case is an interactive process and we're going from system to system and using the different tools. So, um, and I bet somebody else wants to answer that question too. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tag in as well. You know, Tableau is great. Uh, Power BI is really good as well for presenting results. Um, but Mindy, I think what you said there is really key. How how the results need to be presented has to be taken into account. Um, if you were doing that same presentation where you were live editing the pivot charts, uh, Power BI and Tableau just don't really have that capability. Um, we use Power BI uh, because we are a full Microsoft shop. It integrates really well with Excel. It integrates really well when we're just trying to drop the visuals into PowerPoints and Word documents and PDFs and the like. Um, but really, as long as what you are presenting works for your stakeholders, um, we've built a lot of really great graphs for accountants, and uh, they always ask us to put it in Excel. And so we just we start putting it in Excel for them. Okay, and I think you kind of answered this next question also. Can you use Power BI to produce your dashboard? And um, obviously, you know, Jeremy mentioned that we use Power BI. We use it uh, here at BMSS and the accounting firm to, to look at data and, and make budgets and um, and look really for, you know, any kind of project that we, we do. My first go-to is to look at what um, you know, historical trends are in our in our Power BI system. So I can kind of chart how much time um, you know, I think something's going to take based on on that data. Um, and and then do you recommend something else? And it sounds like the answer to that is whatever, you know, works best for you, whatever you're the most comfortable with and uh, and gives you the the information in the format that you need it. Um, and so I think that was our last question. Um, we're coming up on the end of of the our time here. Um, but we really do appreciate everybody being here. We appreciate uh, David and Jeremy um, hopping on and, and giving us more information than I can even comprehend at this moment. But uh, we very much appreciate that. We really appreciate you, Mindy, and appreciate you know your insight and being able to kind of tell us what it's like to be on the on the other side of of the projects that you know that Abacus is able to to kind of facilitate. Um, and then I guess really, if you have any questions, uh, the email addresses for all, all of us, the panelists are um, on your on your screen there. And then uh, CPE certificates will be available in approximately two weeks. Um, but again, you know, BMSS, Abacus, we want to be able to partner with you and and do what we can to to make this, you know, easy and, and to kind of alleviate, you know, that decision fatigue by by using business intelligence. So um, we just thank everybody for being here today and, um, and that's, we'll conclude.